Hi everyone, I'm here with the uh, co-founder of Bitbeam Canon, Corey, and he's another professional pixel artist. And uh, we decided uh, we'd like to start a series of videos where we sort of review and give uh, constructive criticism or analysis to classic, uh, especially console, but classic retro style games, specifically the uh, pixel art and animation end of things. And the first game that we're going to uh, review is going to be Super Mario Brothers 3 for the 8-bit Nintendo. And uh, say hi, Corey. Hey, how's it going? So, and uh, before we dive into the uh, sort of analysis and review, I wanted to quickly mention that I'm going to be using the uh, pixel art program ProMotion NG to analyze and potentially sometimes edit some of the graphics during these videos. Uh, we're especially going to be using it not only because I'm very used to it, but because it's got a lot of really specific features, not only for pixel art in general, but for abiding by the actual technical constraints of color, resolution, and things like that of classic consoles and classic computers. And one last thing to point out is that if I go into File, New Project, Create, and under the type, if I click these three dots here, I can select from this very large list of classic devices, consoles, and computers. And in this case, we're going to be working with the Nintendo Entertainment System. And you'll see if I click here, I had previously compiled uh, very concise technical information, carefully written to make it easily understandable by a graphic artist as opposed to a programmer so that we can quickly remind ourselves or understand what the core technical constraints were for that particular device. So if you need to work on graphics for that specific system, or you want to make a mock-up or game graphics that actually very carefully follow those color restraints and technical restraints, then uh, the built-in documents here in ProMotion are a great way to start that off, to familiar, familiarize yourself with those limitations. And then let me close out of that. The other important thing is if you do start a new project and pick one of these presets, then it's going to automatically close out of that. It, so for example, if I choose Nintendo Entertainment System, you can see it's going to automatically give me the exact colors that the Nintendo can handle and give me the actual screen resolution of the 8-bit Nintendo. And for other systems, if there are other specific limitations, like for uh, RGB channel, which is the, the bit depth or the, uh, the range of color for each value, R, G, and B for the colors, it will automatically set that. So it's just a really good head start for making sure that, that the graphics or mock-up you create match the core graphical limitations of that particular device. All right, so with that all said, I'm going to pass things off to Corey for now to, uh, to get, uh, get into the uh, specifics of Super Mario Brothers 3. So I'll bring up all of the uh, screens that we uh, grabbed of Super Mario, and Corey, just tell me which one you want to start off with. Yeah, if you go uh, back to the top uh, beginning there, uh, the I guess the throne room scene uh, would be a good one to start with. All right, um, that's actually right here. Screen yeah. Palette um, limitations. It's important to note the limitations of the NES. Uh, you have these, you have, for the background tiles, you have your four color palettes, and you have four of them but they all have to share one color. So they're all gonna share either a black or, you know, you'll commonly see black as the color on the NES. And uh, this is a perfect example showing how they worked within the limitations uh, based on this scene. You have the, the sort of um, yellow and reddish orange colors for the throne and the, and the steps there. Right. And how they blend into that background, yet you can see where they stopped drawing the darker blue. Uh, right. So in, in like the background. sort of checkerboard or diamond pattern, right yeah. here, this should be, if there were no such technical constraints, let me make sure isolated fill is turned on, it should look like this. Right. But they could not do that because they have a total of four colors per tile 
counting the background color, which they're using, like you said, in this case, black. Yes, and even though you know they've got eight by eight pixel tiles, the way the NES restraints are is every sixteen by sixteen pixel area has to be filled with one palette. So that's right. why you see a lot of very blocky NES games. Uh, it's very obvious when you look at them compared to maybe some other systems. Um, right. But so this is a perfect example of yes, they. They understood the limitations. They worked around it, and uh, honestly, they they made a pretty good call here because it doesn't. Uh, it's not too distracting. It actually looks like it's almost intentional, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, it's very noticeable. If you know the constraints, uh, you can see this. Um, yep, it looks like this. Uh, so this is I'm using one of these features in promotion. There are actually two ways to get grids to show up, but the most convenient right now is the actual locking grid that lets me uh, grab things based on a grid that I can set in this case to 8 by 8 tiles it was just so I could get a grid to show up on the screen but it looks slightly misaligned vertically by one pixel but I can adjust that yeah. there we go so now that offset is adjusted that's because this screen grab has uh, a little border it was uh, you know, probably when it was screen grabbed from the emulator, it, um, you know, for whatever reason, it's not 100% aligned. But anyway, the, we, you can fix that with this alignment setting. But uh, I just wanted to make things a little more clear. You explained it very well. But one of the things that I was noticing while you were mentioning this, if a uh, screen capture um, software or tool grabs a screenshot it does not keep the color indexes or indices arranged the same way it was in the actual uh, hardware of the Nintendo <laughs> so you can right. see here it just has these the colors that are used just all kind of bunched together on the top left and what Corey was talking about with the uh, four palettes of four is uh, the 8-bit Nintendo gives you uh, the the first 16 colors you can use for the background, but the first color of each four color set has to be the same color. So most of the time people use black because black is used for the outline in almost everything in old uh, kind of 8-bit um, uh, pixel art very, very frequently. And so it was just the, the sort of most efficient um, choice and then the other thing is typically in your game if there are borders you want those borders to be black so they would just go with black for the uh, for the first color so just to I'm going to quickly hopefully move this um, I'm gonna move these colors down out of the way and then remap the image and so now I can give a more realistic example of how these palettes looked. So the first one would be black for each of them. And then for example, I can create the actual palette for the the throne. So you would have black, you obviously have this one teal color. So I'm going to copy one of those. I could actually move it. I guess I'll move it to be more accurate. Um, so I'm going to turn on the move tool, select the color, move the color and then remap so there's that and then there's this red color so I'm going to grab that and move that remap and then the last one is obviously this kind of orange yellow color remap so now that would be one of the actual four color palettes for the background so then the next one would also start with black and then so now we'll do this tile this uh, palette here which has the same one so keep that in mind that's another color sort of y you could look at as sort of wasted because you you have to use that color in multiple different tile sets so unfortunately that one of those 16 colors that you could use is now it's redundant but you need it there so I hope that makes sense go ahead Corey Right, yeah, because it's like even though you could say with all the colors combined, there's 
Oops. you know, there's the shared color and then the uh, 12 other colors. You could say, well, that's 13 colors total. But yeah, a lot of times you would have to double waste, up, yeah, uh, waste the color to to blend between different things or right. something like that. So, so now the question is, where what is the what is the fourth color of that particular tile? I'm not seeing... Uh, it could be in the... Um, check that text box up there. It could be that lighter blue there. Um, Oops. I just, I yeah, see. I think that's what it is. Okay. Or Yeah, that's highly likely. Okay, so let's... Uh... Oops, let's see. Am I moving? There we go. All right. But anyway, that hopefully makes it more clear. This is how your background palettes would be arranged. You would have a color that you have to share for all backgrounds because that's considered the background color of the tile. For technical reasons, it's got to be the same color uh, for all tiles. And then you have potentially three original new colors um, for each four color uh, tile palette and you have four total sets of four but if you don't have to double up anywhere ever if you're very careful and sort of lucky that way um, then you can have a maximum of 13 colors for your background um, and so that that's how it works out that's how it's arranged and uh, in most uh, console systems and computers uh, especially in the 16-bit era they did not have this sort of um, almost semi-arbitrary limited color range to choose from. Like it just had a specific uh, channel bit depth per R, G, and B value for a color. So like in the case of the Mega Drive or Genesis as we Americans knew it as, there were a total of 512 possible colors that the Genesis could display but that number 512 is a result of the fact that the RGB uh, depth was something like, I think it's three, uh, three bits per color channel. I think that's what it is. And I think that that equals 512 possible colors. Um, whereas with the really old 8-bit systems like the Sega Master System and the 8-bit uh, Nintendo here, they had these... Uh, sort of a little less scientific uh, color ranges to choose from. So when I set the uh, project type in ProMotion when creating a new project, it didn't limit the channel bit depth. It kept it at eight uh, per channel, which is full 24 bit color range. But what you need to do when you want to create authentic 64 uh, 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 8 bit Nintendo uh, graphics you need to not only understand the uh, how the palette needs to be divided up, like that rule with the background, 16 total color indexes, but the first of each four has to all be identical. And so then it's, um, you know, each three colors remaining can be their own unique colors, unless for the sake of level design, you need to double up on a color so it can be in two different palettes. Um, but so what, what typically what you would do in promotion or most painting programs you would want this color palette somewhere in your palette so that you can um, see and pick the colors you have at your disposal so like by default in promotion they're at the bottom so then what you would do is while you're creating your palette you would want to use the top 16 colors as your background range of colors so you would just copy colors. You don't have to move them. You could just copy them right over. So for example, if you chose black, you could just say, okay, for my background, I want a, a nice bright sky. So I'm going to copy this light blue. Oh, I'm still in the moving mode. One second. So you might want to copy this light blue over. I'm just pressing the C key after picking it. And then I click and I um, can click a copy where I want to. And then you might want white for white clouds and then maybe a darker blue to shadow the clouds or something like that. So that's my uh, first uh, four color tile palette for uh, background tiles and I can draw my sky with that and so on and so forth. So and then the second row of 16 colors would be very similar but those would be your sprite 
uh, palettes, and it's divided the same way. For sprites on the Nintendo, you have any sprite can display from it can display three colors from any of the four uh, three color sprite palettes. And so, for example, if I wanted fireballs in my game, I might want to create a sprite palette that would be um, like a white, an orangey yellow, and a uh, a bright red. So I could draw my fireballs with that. And you'll see again, you can leave it black if you want, or make it programmer pink, it doesn't matter. But that first color is treated as transparent for every sprite. So again, you might think, oh, you know, it's two rows of 16, so, uh, so for my Nintendo mock-up, I can make a 32-color game. But that's not the case. At best, you actually have 13 colors for the background, and uh, th uh, 4 times 3, so 12 colors four sprites because the first index for each set of four can't be used in the actual art of the sprite it's just used as a transparent color did that all make sense Corey? did i mess anything up no that makes perfect sense that is okay. exactly the way it is yep all right. and you can see like uh one one noticeable example here is you'll see a lot of sprites like this turtle here on right. the screen that he looks like he's using more colors than the limitations, but it's actually because the sprites are divided up into those 8x8 eight eight tile areas. Right. And each of those can use a different palette if you want on right. sprites. So it looks like they've drawn his shell with like a different green right. palette and then you know the rest of them with something else. So, right, exactly. Um, so the, th those tricks are used, yeah, to make l a little bit more complex sprites from right. time to time. So I'm going to adjust the horizontal alignment of the uh, grid and set mm -hmm. it to 8 so we can see that a little better. I don't know how well you can see it on the screen share, Corey, but uh, yeah. so now you can see that these greens here are horizontally divided. You see there's a nice clean divide for this green shell. So mm -hmm. the orange color is never in the same 8x8 sprite image as, as the green of the shell. So while you end up with, I guess, a four color, am I reading that right? So black, white, orange, and green. So it's a four color mm -hmm. character but it's actually following the three color maximum sprite um, rule because each sprite is actually eight by eight tile uh, pixels. Uh, and as you can see, they just were careful with the art design so that, uh, and then vertically it's going to be similar. I don't know how they cut it specifically, but if you it's move... probably something like that, like you just had it, yeah. um, where it's like, yeah, maybe his feet uh, were right. at the top of a sprite section. And remember, you know, right. people could shift these these eight by eight sprites around as well. They didn't right. have to be a perfect grid necessarily. So, right. like, if you needed someone's head uh, or something to be, you know, a one eight by eight sprite, and it needs to be in the middle, that could right. be shifted over. These are all little programming techniques people would use. Right. for sprites but uh yeah on the yeah. nes and that is one one thing that i uh th that i covered briefly in a, a past video just in general speaking about uh pixel art is keep that in mind all aspiring pixel artists or sort of hobbyist pixel artists or modern pixel artists that don't have to worry about the kind of constraints that professional pixel artists uh, were faced with when making games for consoles uh, back in the day, keep that in mind. Uh, it's it's not just about the decisions of the artist based on purely aesthetic uh, decisions. The more than half of the ability of classic pixel artists was the ability to understand and work within these severe technical uh, constraints. So keep that in mind. A lot of times if you see a decision that is not how you would have done it or less than ideal or if something looks a little stiff or something like that very often or typically that would be because the artist was working with the severe constraints of memory and having to fit within a grid and only having so many colors and things like that so 
that's one of the things that we want and we hope is very interesting in these videos we want people like modern pixel artists to have a better grasp of why pixel art especially classic pixel art from beloved games why it looks the way it looks like where that aesthetic of pixel art comes from that modern artists emulate without understanding where those limitations came from and why yeah. therefore how that aesthetic came to be so anyway and th that's also very true for how smooth an animation is and, and things like that so uh i guess we can get rid of the splash screen for now mm -hmm. um and let's see i'll turn off the grid here and i think we're done with this i think that all makes sense now mm -hmm. and so now i'm going to go back to this folder and go ahead and pick another uh screen we can sort of jump all over the place um right. so don't um, worry too much about staying on one theme uh we could do the the coin uh screens just to do the quick example um the, these two here Yes, uh, okay. the the coins, for example, in Mario Three um, were not sprites uh, because the sprite limitations for the NES were you could only have eight horizontal eight by eight sprites right uh, in a row uh, horizontally. You could do as many as you wanted vertically. Um, right. Obviously, there's a a maximum limit of 64 on the entire screen but right. you know once you went beyond that 8 you would see a lot of flicker and there were tons of NES games with loads of flicker right. to avoid this with the coins they made the coins as tiles so right. they're so, a 16 by 16 tile that animates right so yeah that's the cool thing you can animate tiles and in later generation games on the 8-bit Nintendo they started putting helper chips little processors into the cartridge that increased the overall abilities of the 8-bit Nintendo so that it could display more animated tiles on screen. Um, it, could, could just, it just gave it more computing and basically screen updating power. So I know a Super Mario 3 put use to such a chip so it was actually able to display a very large amount of animated tiles on the screen at a time uh, which just can add to a lot of um, sort of extra polish um, to the game's overall presentation or production value. So, mm -hmm. and I, I remember playing that game uh, as a, uh, a child when the game was new and really bl being uh, awestruck. There's a particular level uh, called Coin Castle and I actually have a, uh, a YouTube video pulled up just for this. So here you have in, in this uh, Coin Castle, every last uh so obviously all of these bricks are tiles but they're the kind of tile that you can interact with so that means when mario jumps up and hits it with his head it will shatter and so what's interesting about this is the way they had to program this is there's no way all of those bricks could have been tiles so what they were doing was they were uh computing collisions with uh, specific tile types so you had this tile type that was a breakable brick and then if Mario's head made contact from the underside of a breakable brick what they would do is immediately replace that tile in the background with the background tile so it looks like that brick disappeared and they would simultaneously create these four little brick shrapnel sprites so the moving objects, the sprites would take over and create the illusion that that brick shattered when actually what happened was that tile basically got replaced and sort of popped away, got replaced by background graphics, and then the, um, and then the shrapnel appears. But the, the real reason I have this uh, video queued up is that P button here, uh, when Mario jumps up on that, what happens in the game design is every last one of these breakable uh, brick tiles changes into a coin that Mario can collect. So it blew my mind at the time, keep in mind that at the time the 8-bit Nintendo was about as powerful as it got unless you went to the, to the um, well that's not true actually, by the time this came out uh, more powerful uh, home consoles were out and um, 
uh, arcade games. But to see something like this on the 8-bit Nintendo was pretty mind-blowing. So let me play the actual video here. Um, so you can see he's about to jump on it. And now, so, now suddenly he can interact directly with all of these collectible coins. And um, yeah, just to see that many objects on screen that he could uh, collect is pretty amazing. And it's really subtle and hard to see on the slightly blurry video. But also, even while they're bricks, every last one of them is playing an occasional shine animation. So that's it for this video, but uh, I hope that makes sense. And um, that's why we have these two screens here. There we go. So you can see this coin here. Uh, is screen share still keeping up well, Corey? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can see this is where a coin is. And everywhere where the stars in the background or whatever these dots are supposed to be, where these two dots are white instead of this brownish color, that's where a coin used to be. And the reason that is, is because for some reason they kept the palette of the tile the same as the coin palette instead of swapping which palette the tile used to be the, uh, the palette of the uh, standard background, which presu presumably they could have done, but Super Mario 3 is so polished, I'm sure there was some kind of reason, maybe for mm -hmm. performance, because if you think back to uh, Coin Castle, Maybe it would have taken too much processing power to not only swap out the image, but also swap out the palette that it's using. That's just a guess. But mm -hmm. for whatever reason, this sort of um, hints at the trick they're using that they're, that the coin is a tile and that it's um, they're replacing the uh, replacing the the tile image, but not the palette. And one more thing that just popped into my mind is. You can see that this coin is in its side view frame. Mm -hmm. So it's in the animated tile. So they are capable. And as I said in that video I closed, unfortunately, in Coin Castle, if you remember, those coins were not animated. But the 8-bit the Nintendo, with this helper chip at least, was capable of animating every last coin because the, uh, the blocks, were there were just as many breakable blocks and they were animated. So yep. this is one of those things about visual uh, choices to make your game uh, more pleasant or communicate better. So our best guess is it would have been super distractive, distracting uh, or dizzying if suddenly the screen became a bunch of rotating coins. That probably would have caused motion sickness or worse, at least in some people. So most likely that was a, an aesthetic uh, design choice because they had most likely the frames for the coins could have fit in memory for the spinning um, but they uh, they decided not to have the coins animated in Coin Castle yep yeah I, I, I suspect that's the case because the, the coins yeah. when you see them animating they they move quite a lot. Yeah, um, and that they, all they over the screen. Quite a bit. Yeah, yeah exactly. that all over the screen in columns and rows would have been uh, very distracting and probably disorienting, at least to a lot of people. So, uh, and that is something that you're going to hear me talking about on almost all of these videos is the concept that I call uh, confetti, the, the confetti syndrome that a lot of uh, especially, ironically, especially out of 16-bit and especially Sega Mega Drive games suffer from, uh, which is when uh, artists put too much detail, especially into background art, and it actually can be, that's not animated, but I'm just saying, um, you want to try to be careful not to have your, for gameplay, uh, in a gameplay-related way, um, unimportant things, you don't want them to, to distract the player. You want it to be super clear, what are things I can interact with, what's a platform I can land on, what's a wall that's going to stop my process, uh, progress, what is uh, a spike that's going to hurt me if I land on it. All of those things have to be immediately, instantly obvious to the player, uh, so you don't want them distracted by um, things that are literally just background stuff that's just there to look nice and help set the atmosphere. Um, 
So we'll close those images. I think yeah, we're speaking of that, it yep. would be worth bringing up the um, the one screenshot where we had of the cloud. Uh, yes. Or any of Good them one. with the clouds, really, uh, yep. that give you an example of that. Yep. How uh, it's interesting that this game. One second, let me get them up on screen. Yeah, we'll start with, with the actual one. This is the how it actually is in the game. And we're talking mm -hmm. about this cloud here. Yeah, they kept consistent with the black outline, even on background elements, including those bushes there. Yep. Um, which, uh, it, don't get me wrong, it, like the game is beautiful, and right. it, it keeps a very cartoony style, but it's interesting how, uh, you know, they... They, they they sort of gambled with it because right. you could say that, yeah, the, that cloud looks like something you could potentially interact with. Right, uh, especially in the case of this particular game because it, at least it's definitely in Super Mario 2, which is the same franchise. I forget, does it exist in 3? Maybe not. Maybe it's only 2. But it's already established in Mario that the, some clouds, at least in Super Mario 2, you could... There was... Um, an enemy controlling a cloud and you could kill the enemy and then jump in the cloud and fly around mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah and come I to think, think of were, that. yeah i think there were also like cloud platforms too in this game um, right so that is dangerous the, the, the sharper the contrast something is and you, this is a white object and giving something a black stark black outline inherently gives it a drastically sharper co contrast and so in a sense you're telling the player this thing's important even though that's purely a background element and it's not important at all and so as Corey was saying uh, like if we look at these bushes here another and keep in mind like Corey and I both have massive respect for this game and the visual artists and whoever art directed it did an absolutely fantastic job this was like the game that really solidified and created the quintessential sort of visual canon, the aesthetic uh, for my Mario games from then on. It really, mm -hmm. really hit the nail on the head. And um, Corey and I were discussing this before. They didn't bend over backwards to try to hide the technical constraints of the Nintendo. What they did was work really hard to make an incre incredibly polished and pleasing looking game within those technical constraints so they right. didn't do late later generations a lot of games that came around at the same time they were coming up with really cool clever hardware banging tricks and other tricks to create these illusions that the nintendo was more m much more graphically powerful than it was getting more colors in a in a character or in the background and or in things like that and like slicing up the screen for a lot of layered scrolling but they went with a very different approach for Super Mario 3. They kept it simple, but just made it extremely polished. But one of the interesting, clear decisions they made, 99% of the time, they stuck with the black outline, which is, you know, typical uh, cartoon and even coloring book sort of style. But one thing they could have done... I'm going to use the bushes as as an example here. So we have two bushes side by side. And what they could have done was not have the black outline and use the dark green as the outline color instead. And what that would do, and obviously this is a quick hack, I um, could potentially tweak it more based on this sort of idea or aesthetic but you can see as i pull back it's just the contrast is a little softer and it's it, it's a little less likely that someone will mistake it for an enemy blob or something that you're going to land on or something like that and this is especially the case in the case of the cloud and when we previously had this discussion you can see here that i did the same thing with this cloud i just got rid of the black outline and you can see now that if you were playing this version of Mario, you would not mistake that cloud for something you could potentially interact with. And the one last interesting point here is in like 99% of the graphics for the game, they stick with this 
black outline motif even for things that you don't interact with yet in this particular level they decided to randomly have power-up symbols almost like chalk drawings with just white um, just white outlines and you could see and you can just imagine the reason they did that was if it were colored and or had the black stroke the player would try to grab it because he's used to that graphical representation meaning I grabbed that for an ability. So they knew to reduce the contrast and not have a black outline for those particular symbols because they knew that would cause confusion. But overall, in the rest of the game, they were pretty, like, um, very dedicated to the rule of everything having a black outline. I, I think it's worth noting, too, that I think the the reason it still kind of works with the black outline uh, is that everything that you can stand on or that represents a wall or a floor is completely straight and very right. boxy. Right. Uh, and everything that isn't, that is a background element or something like that, has some sort of roundness to it where it, it looks like it's not a block, it's not a, you know... So the, like that, those, those square steps there... Um, you know that's it's a, that's obviously the thing you can stand on, and right. I think keeping that motif uh, consistent throughout the game is what sells it. Even though, right. yeah, yeah, if you were just looking at this screenshot by itself, or maybe just some of this in isolation, it it can become like oh that black outline. But it's interesting how they they were still able to get away with it because right. of that decision and uh right. Part, it, it was a yeah. very fine line you know that mm -hmm. they were they were on with that you right. know yep and and they even made that decision at the cost of extra color they could have used because the background color that is shared mm -hmm. for this scene um is the blue color because in in certain levels you can go back behind the background elements right so that color had to be so right. they're even using the black on top so if you notice most of the tiles they just have the black to, and two colors and right. then the sky color right so uh, it, it did drastically limit their color palette to go with this black outline that's a really good point from a very mm -hmm. technical uh, point of view so they wanted it was so important for them and remember like this isn't a criticism like hey they were dumb or we disagree with it Th this is just sort of the kinds of information that you need to know understanding the technical uh constraints and the gameplay sort of communication uh, ramifications of decisions uh will help you weigh how much you should fight for or try to stick with a certain aesthetic. So very likely this conversation could have happened at the studio that made this game. Okay, if we want to go with this uh, black outline aesthetic for everything, the artists are going to have several fewer colors to be able to use to make the graphics as pretty as possible. Um, and uh, yeah, and there's going to be potential gameplay confusion with what you can interact with and what you can't, because inherently, almost no matter what the other colors are, if it's outlined in black, it's going to be stark contrast and have um, you know uh, a, a strong sense of importance visually. And obviously, the only case that the only time that's not the case is if all the other colors in that particular tile are also very dark so that there's not a lot of contrast between the black and the white which actually does exist in one of the other screenshots I might as well bring up now like that's the case in the coin backgrounds actually and that's also the case here in this boss battle so if you look here mm -hmm. and again like you can see probably for the same sort of reasons that look at the background it's pitch black and then one other color in several of these tiles and I can't think of a legitimate reason for this other than for some reason they were using black as a color and as the background color in this case, which is really weird. It's also, you know I mean? uh, yeah, it's also a good example. It looks like the uh, the pattern on those um, 
I guess you could say, uh, yes, yes, is the same as the floor. So they they actually have a palette in the background that is using double use of black to get right. that just highlight. And, I mean, they that's an excellent point. They could have uh, went with more color there and maybe pulled it off, but, but you know, they, maybe the they contrast, knew it would go against yeah. the aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, it so. would have been too high because the color range is more limited, especially in the darks. You'll notice that uh, I'm going to create a new project again so we can see the nice, clean uh, Nintendo palette. New project, create NES. Oops, there we go. All right, so here's the palette, and you can see there are very few really dark colors, and very few, and there's no other really dark colors near them or in between them and black. So especially yeah. in your darks, you like if they wanted to make this. All right, I'll close the screen and the screen. All right, so if you wanted to create. Um, more than a two color background that was the problem is it wouldn't be very dark so to simulate it i'm not going to try to use a real 8-bit nintendo color but let's just say uh, so let's just say that was the next darkest color right and it might even be worse than this there's a good chance it's worse than this but so let's just say that that's that's the potential other color Let's see, how am I going to do this? Uh, so we'll just grab this whole thing, and I'm going to stamp it here. And then I'm going to fill this color like this. So let's, oops. And then, so this would be the darkest color available in the palette. So then you'd have to make the judgment call for gameplay design and for aesthetics, if the whole background were this vibrant, would that be, you know, really hacking it around here, but you get the idea, let's see. Mm -hmm. So if the whole background were this bright, and it probably would be worse, mm -hmm. then would that yeah. be too distracting for gameplay? So yeah, that, that just looks way worse. So Corey brought up a really important point. And I didn't talk much about memory constraints yet, but the 8-bit Nintendo had extremely limited um, uh, amount of little 8x8 tiles it can hold in memory at a time. So luckily, cartridge-based systems like the 8-bit Nintendo, it could very quickly swap out one set of tiles or a part of a set of tiles for another but the problem is that's not a solution if you need to display all of those things on screen at the same time. If it needs to all be on the screen at the same time, it all needs to be in memory at that moment. So swapping out is great for, like, for example, when Mario grabs a power-up and Mario now looks different and it's more than just a palette swap. Like when, when Mario grabs the uh, uh, fire flower, n no actual pixels change in his art. It's just his palette that changes. So that one three-color sprite palette changes, and that makes him look like, oh, I'm, I'm the fire power Mario. But the other power-ups, like the, um, the uh, what is it called? Um, the, like the leaf, uh, the raccoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I can't remember the word. They're not exactly raccoons. It's a Japanese animal. Uh, it's something yeah, like yeah. oh, I can't. How can I not remember that word? It's something like kanuki, or it's not kabuki. I know that. I can't remember what the word is. That's the driving tanuki. me nuts. Tanuki, tanuki. tanuki that's yeah. it. Thanks so much. I knew it. <laughs> ah, I knew I was on the right track. Um, you know. Uh, but anyway, so um, so when Mario has to completely change his look, what the nice thing is, what they can do is like just on the fly from the cartridges data swap out into memory the uh, the art that's used for Mario. Uh, and that's great for when you don't need both the regular Mario and the Tanuki Mario on the screen at the same time. If you did, you'd be in big trouble because then you wouldn't have any memory left for background tiles or bosses or enemies. So mm -hmm. uh, keep that in mind. Memory constraints were huge. So one of the ways that they made much prettier games is putting used to the fact that any sprite or any tile could be 
shift it over, so to speak, to use one of the different palettes. So you had four background tile palettes. Any tile, you could make use any of the four palettes. So if you were careful and you arranged all of your palettes the same way, like from light to dark or dark to light, then when you swapped which palette that tile was using, it could still be pleasant. And um, in this case, which Corey spotted very expertly, these floor tiles are the same as the background tiles and obviously the same as the wall tiles. And what they did to make it the background tiles is they made they just made the same art use uh, different one of the different palettes. And what Corey pointed out was they doubled up on black in that palette so that the tile was dark and muted because their other option, if they didn't want to quote unquote waste a color, would have been a visually less appealing uh, environment that would have been more distracting to the player. Not only would it have looked worse, but it would be harder to play because the character sprites and the like bullets that the enemy shoots would be harder to see. Also, uh, and I don't know exactly if this is going on, but I noticed that the the boss sprite, you know, is using what seems to be an extra color, and right. I'm wondering if that's the the reason that they put it on a black background, or if they oh. actually have a black outline or not. Um, that's a really clever idea. Now, the interesting thing is, if that were true, if you carefully paused it and screen grabbed it in an emulator. When the enemy went over, I'm changing the background color when I grab the sprite now, you would actually see that dark teal color through the outline of the sprite. And that's very possible because it's pretty hard to notice. The other thing is I don't think this enemy ever jumps. Or they might, but maybe when they transform think, to I a think shell. this one does. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But as you can see, because that background tile is so dark, it's pretty hard to notice. So that would be one clever way. Um, oh, wait a minute. Actually, no, but you're still is... only going to have three colors. But, but one wouldn't be wasted on black. So there would be, you're right, there would be the illusion of a, of a, a, I mean, a there fourth is... color. Yeah, which yeah, would be black. Yeah, there is the possibility there where it's like they, they could have uh, done some sort of doubling up on the sprite to still give it the black outline uh, right. stacking sprites because you know right. with this one boss um, they they could have gotten away with it possibly in the yeah. scene but there definitely um, would be extra flickering like Mario is at least two I think more than that like I think often he's three sprites wide and you have eight total so uh, this character is at least four wide counting the um the scepter so just the enemy alone would be eight i think yeah so look at yeah 28 um so eight times four is 32 so it's over it's yeah it's over seven at least uh All seven right, times I'm, uh yeah i'm taking a look at a different screenshot um right. that has one of the bosses jumping in front of the blue and yeah the blue is visible awesome so that, that is the trick they're doing great job great um, job spotting that's that. why they chose the black background for yep. the boss and so that's they why they made that sure color. that's also another reason they made sure the background was very dark so it was a much better decision to forego one of the potential colors to keep that background dark because if they used a lighter color in here it would stick out like a sore thumb when the enemy went over it just to show you uh, so I'm gonna make black the background color again oh, yeah. grab this yeah, look at that reinforced like, yeah that would be that would bad. be terrible the character would look like a ghost you know and I mean? amazingly enough, out of all the times I've played this game, that's never something noticed. I never actually noticed. You know, with yeah, well, that blue that's, popping through. That's the know? thing. They they pulled it off. It was the perfect crime. So, like, these are the kind of decisions that they you, you had to be clever and flexible as a pixel artist. And back then, you were also on extremely tight deadlines. So keep that in mind. I'm not knocking. There are some insanely good and very talented modern pixel artists. But the more you understand the original constraints where that that artist had to deal with when pixel art evolved as an aesthetic that we now love and emulate, these are the sort of challenges that they had to face. 
So again, when you see certain things and you go, boy, that wasn't that good, that artist wasn't that good, odds are they were way better than you think and they were just dealing with far greater challenges than you, you realize. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so... Um, yeah, excellent points, and I call that uh, forensic pixology. By the way, <laughs> this is something that uh, expert, like old school pixel artists, can do. When we see pixel art, we can often uh, actually detect what methodology or workflow was used to create the pixel art, and can actually, as Corey so beautifully demonstrated here, can actually figure out what technical strengths, ways that they. Uh, went around or created the illusion to hide specific or compensate for specific technical constraints. So uh, kudos once again, Corey. That was a beautiful observation, beautifully done. Um, so I think we're done otherwise with the boss screen. So mm -hmm. that is one, one point about uh, the Mario game is there is very, very little to critique from an artistic, purely aesthetic standpoint. Like they nailed a what became an incredibly art, uh, iconic style, and they worked within extreme constraints and just created something that that you know pop culture just universally came to love. So, like, and and to to get to the point, uh, I had talked about constraints a little bit before, and we were talking about the constraints of um, tiles and things like that. And I touched on memory, but uh, I just want to bring up an actual sprite rip set of the uh, all the full frames of Mario. So um, let me quickly load that up. Let's see. So I have another folder here, and we're just going to grab Mario. So when you see a giant sprite sheet like this, it can be extremely deceptive to a modern pixel artist or aspiring pixel artist. What you need to understand is the 8-bit Nintendo had no chance in hell of ever fitting even half of this in memory. So the way that they did this, one thing that was great that the Nintendo had at their disposal was that it could flip horizontally or vertically any sprite instantaneously that it was displaying without a hit to performance. So already if you look at the sprite sheet one of the reasons it's so huge is that it is it's displaying the flipped versions as entirely new images which is not the case. The artist would only draw the character facing one direction and the Nintendo would flip those sprites when the character was facing the other way. But the other, and the other thing I mentioned, as you can see, Firepower Mario there is the same exact pixel art as regular large Mario, but it's just a palette change. So all they did was change those three colors in the palette on the fly when you got the power, and then Mario uh, changed his look so you immediately knew that Mario could throw the fireball. And Corey had made a great point uh, when we had a previous discussion about this. The downside, the thing you have to be careful about that with palette changes for player characters when they get new power-ups, is remember, you only have four three-color palettes for sprites. And you're using at least one three-color palette for your player character. So if you want to be able to change the, the player's looks by changing his palette, keep in mind that means if any other sprite on screen uses the same palette, it's going to change its colors too. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice in games like Mega Man, when you change your which weapon you're using, it'll change Mega Man's colors, but some pickups items on the screen will also change color because they use the same palette. And I think they managed to avoid that entirely in Super Mario 3. I don't recall anything else on screen ever changing color. But nope. if that's the case, that is because they were careful and they made another compromise. They, they traded off the colors that they could use elsewhere to say, okay, we want to be able to change Mario's colors and we don't want anything else on screen to change. So keep in mind, there's always this trade-off. So even those pixel artists that know, oh, the 8-bit uh, Nintendo could only display 
16 colors for sprites, 16 colors for background. That's not true. You had to have the same color for the first index of each set. And uh, for sprites, it was actually three colors and transparent. And very often you needed redundant colors in your tile sets that was wasting colors, so to speak. And uh, if you wanted to be able to change the colors in your character and not have it change other stuff like enemies or pickups, you had to reserve those colors and only use them for the player. So there's all these trade-offs. What's more important, A or B? Um, so those are the kind of decisions that always have to be going through your head. And the other last massive bit of important information that, uh, that you need to know when criticizing or studying an 8-bit Nintendo game uh, is that if you look at these frames, one thing that we noticed earlier when discussing this, which was a revelation to both of us and quite shocking, is the Super Mario's running frame is three frames, but if you look at... Um, I'm just going to grab his top half here. Oops, change the background color. Grab his top half. And you'll see I'll stamp that down and nothing changed. It's exactly the same art for the overwhelming majority of each running frame. And they only changed a couple of 8x8 eight eight tiles to put the legs in different positions. So they did not have, even though the modern artist and especially even modern pixel artist would think a three frame run cycle is already incredibly limiting it's worse than that you had to make sure to in order to fit all of the characters animations and memory you had to make sure the overwhelming majority of time that most of the frame most of the character art for most frames was these eight by eight chunks that were reused over the majority of frames. So uh, the other really amazing thing that we realized is this extreme most frame of the run animation is also used as Mario's jump animation. This one frame doubles as the extreme leg spread out frame for running and it is the jump frame. So that is efficient use. And it's such an iconic look to the jump Mm -hmm. So they did a great job making a, a critical keyframe, so to speak. There's only keyframes, technically, in this style of animating. But this critical frame was uh, reused. So all of the 8x8 sections, not only is the head obviously used in virtually every frame of animation for Mario, but the entire frame was reused for the jumping and the extreme of the of the run and one other thing i mentioned before in our previous conversation is that because they used the stroke color for mario's overalls because his legs are pitch black and you can't see an outline there's visually no such thing at, between a front leg and a back leg so that meant when you do the run animation and you're basically ping-ponging between those three frames, if you try to do it legitimately and the character has uh, an actual black outline and a different colored legs, there would be that problem that you only have one frame and it would be either the front leg or back leg that is an either or left or right leg is either forward or back. You don't have the equivalent frame for when the other leg is far forward and the other leg is back so because they uh, went with this uh, black stroke color and the um, pants the overall color being the same color they were able to get away with a lot more of reusing frames yep without it looking weird very very beautifully designed sprite yeah. I have to say yep not only an iconic character but they took uh, a very dated, even at the time, when you look back at the original uh, Mario Brothers and then Super Mario Brothers, you had a very sort of Atari 2600, like ancient arcade sprite, which had very little charm to it. And just with, with that power boost that the 8-bit Nintendo offered, uh, slight increase to resolution and number of colors, they managed to create this amazingly charming and uh, iconic 
character out of very few pixels and very few colors. And that's the other really important thing. Uh, when you're animating at this level, it all comes down to silhouette and what I call readability. Right? Like you no longer, mm -hmm. you no longer have uh, as many frames as you want to create these animations that are impressive purely for the sake of how smooth they are. Now it's all about like you only have the keyframes. You don't have any tweens. You need to basically nail the uh, the aesthetic um, aspect of each keyframe and how well it sells the motion. How well is it? Uh, how readable is it? How easily can the player understand what the player is doing? Even though you're missing all between all of the between frames, it's all the more critical that the because the only frames that exist are the keyframes. They have to communicate incredibly well so that the brain of the player will fill in the gaps. Anyway, yep. Uh, that's uh, about all I think we need to talk about with uh, sprites in general. Um, but yeah, uh, get a hold, anyone interested in this, get a hold of these sort of sprite rips and you can look and see that the overwhelming majority of the frames uh, reuse tiles with uh, all of the other frames. Oh, another one other interesting point. Even with the Tanuki Mario here, uh, or is, I think the Tanuki one is specifically the one that can turn into the statue. Yeah, Maybe this yeah. one is the raccoon Mario, actually. Or just, I don't know if they ever call him a raccoon, but he's the flying Mario. Probably because, whatever. Uh, that, that's too yeah. much of a digression, <laughs> I'm not sure. But anyway, the... Um, don't know the official lore. Yeah, yeah, but you, you can see that this Mario is also identical to the normal Mario, except they slap on an 8x8 eight eight, uh, tile sprite, and they change up the two 8x8 uh, eight eight tiles that make the top of the hat to give him the ears. So again, mm -hmm. they are saving a large amount of memory. And keep in mind, even though you could swap out of the cartridge, there's still a matter of total memory, which was tiny, that you could fit on the entire cartridge. Right. So even if you could go, oh, it's great, we can swap out from the cartridge. Back then, cartridges were so expensive to produce, they could not produce uh, cartridges with a lot of storage. So they even had to be careful, even though they could swap out, they were quickly filling, out, filling up their total amount of graphics they could fit in the entire cartridge. So even when you introduced a version of the character, with new powers, it was often still necessary to try to make sure that you were using clever tricks like palette swaps and or that you were just relying on swapping out a few of these 8x8 eight eight, uh, sprites, 8x8 eight eight tiles, uh, pixel yeah, I sprites. Think most, um, yeah, I think most NES uh, cartridges were around the 256 kilobyte yeah. in size uh you know that they could fit on the entire thing i mean right. i do think mario 3 is a little bit bigger than that right. i think they made right. an exception and gave it a different kind of cartridge that right. could hold more memory but uh yeah still I mean, you're, you're incredibly not small NES game that's bigger than than you know there's there's a few rare exceptions of them right. being larger than a meg or something right. extremely still, rare yeah and keep in mind this is not to fit the graphics this is right. to fit everything the game logic all of the tile maps the, the the actual data for how every level is constructed and super mario 3 has a lot of levels and then mm. there you know like i said there's the game logic itself where any every enemy is positioned the music the sound effects everything needs to fit in that tiny cartridge so even when you think you've done enough fitting a given level into the memory you could quickly run out you could you could do one level and say oh i'm going to be clever and we can swap out from the cartridge to you know to have the boss appear or to have new tile graphics to change the environment as you go through the level or you could do all those clever things but uh, be careful because even though you're swapping out and you're getting more visual variety in that one level you may blow out your cartridge <laughs> memory on that one <laughs> Nobody level. Nobody likes to blow out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so there you go. So th there's uh, there's how that goes. Um, and then let's pick another 
screen. Let me go back to the screen grabs. We'll start there. There is, I did want to talk about this. Oh, just because you had mentioned it already, we should mm -hmm. use this screen. So for those that don't know, and if you don't know, if you like video games at all, you owe it to yourself to get a hold of however you can Super Mario 3 and play it. It is one of, in my opinion, one of the first great and greatest masterpieces of game design in general for gameplay, but also just for game creation. It is the pinnacle of 8-bit uh, AAA games. Its quality is astounding. Its replay value is, is just through the roof. And But anyway, at this specific spot in World 1 uh, level... Is it the third section of World 1? I don't remember. Uh, but um, it's, is it the very first section? It's, I, I, it's either, I think it's level number three or something like that. It's either three or like four. That. I think it's yeah. three, though. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's got this little spot in it. So this white tile, you get to the very, right near the end of the level, and you duck down, and you just hold down for three, something like three seconds while you're on there. It might be longer, I don't remember. But you just duck down there and don't do anything. And Mario will suddenly fall behind all of the graphics. So remember what Corey was saying. The reason that each of these tiles only have two colors and uh, black is because instead of using black as the background color, they needed to use the sky color as the background color specifically so that Mario could go back there. And I can demonstrate that perfectly in ProMotion. If I set that to my background color and then grab Mario as a sprite, Oh, I need to turn the stencil on, sorry. Uh, brain fart there. Well, let's see. Uh, so I'm going to pick that as a stencil color, reverse it, and uh, go back here. So you can see Mario can now fall behind the background graphics, which is exactly what it did. And remember, this is a screen grab, so it's not taking into account. Like, they clearly doubled up on some colors to so that this didn't happen. But, Actually, I think that does happen. Oh, okay, okay uh, that I, I does think happen. You see in the, him okay. through the little spots on the bushes. Yeah. Okay, so you played um, more recently, so you know better than me. But that the only other solution would be to double up on colors. In in that case, they couldn't have because they had the background color black. Yeah, that would have been four colors. So anyway, so the secret is you hold down and then he falls behind. So that's how they. In order for that to work they needed that to be the background color which meant black needed to be one of the three remaining colors so anyway uh forensic pixology mm -hmm. <laughs> all right so i think we're done with that screen and now i wanted to quickly go back on that topic of confetti syndrome yes so the only and this is, again, this is always a, ba a matter of personal taste, uh, but weighing the actual ramifications of not just things like memory, but more importantly, communicating to the player and how you're affecting gameplay. And I, I warn my suggestion to artists that are doing actual game graphics or mock-ups that look like actual video games keep this in mind background elements that are there purely for being pretty and for setting the sort of mood and atmosphere they should inherently and automatically at instantaneously at a glance they should communicate to the player nothing other than i'm pretty i'm this this is the environment that the character is but it what it should not do is distract the player and they made an incredibly bold decision with the fill pattern of those background hills or bushes, whatever okay. they're supposed to be. That is not only sharp angles in bright contrasting vivid green, but it is also a repeating pattern that is blatantly repeating. Like th this is like, if you see this screen at as, as a glance, nothing grabs your attention more than something that's supposed to be the least important thing from a gameplay point. And that is dangerous to do. It is not necessarily wrong to do. And remember, this team, 
we have nothing respect for. They did amazing work. Mario 3 in every way is a brilliant game. However, boy, did they have uh, cojones for, <laughs> for making this decision. And in this screenshot, the Mario is both in his... Uh, t actually, that is the Tanuki suit in this case not the regular <laughs> raccoon power up it doesn't and get in the green the boot what well, that is power boot. <laughs> T tanuki boot we'll just call yes. it that but you'll see like especially you've already got that green and it's a very distracting pattern and then you've got him there mario almost disappears and i know you just saw me put him there and i know you can see his tanuki head but i'm talking about at a glance it's now becoming like you could see how nicely he shows up there against the 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 sky. Well, also imagine if you yeah. were because I know in this game uh, they did the classic trick of like when they did Luigi, it was just right. a recolored Mario. So like if exactly. you were Luigi in that green, boot all green, and you got in front of that thing, you right? Know. And so it's bad enough that you're just dealing with like you're going to have to allow for that often on the eight bit Nintendo because you've got. A total of like something like 50 colors total possible colors you can use and then there's only like 40 no no uh something in the area of like 26 maximum total colors you could have uh, i'm not doing the actual math right now so correct me if i'm whatever it is it's it's less way less than 32 colors and mm -hmm. then a lot of times you have to double up and all of this so you're going to end up frequently with characters or enemies that have to end up in front of the same color as a color that's in them however when you make it very high contrast and a repeating pattern and those sorts of things you're making it harder and harder you're literally fighting with you're fighting against the what in my opinion should be top priority is communication to the player so for whatever reason they maybe they really liked it maybe they just really felt that that repeating pattern pattern harkened back to the more of the aesthetic of like super mario one and two i don't know but you know that's irrelevant the game is still gorgeous but my point is this was the most bold and in my opinion questionable decision uh yeah. just because it really becomes very distracting um so and then the other thing is like you have these round background hills or bushes which should be inherently a soft thing like every other bush they draw yet now they're putting this incredibly abstracted hard angular pattern so a really interesting and in question in my opinion like it brings up questions i don't mean questionable like they were idiots or whatever i'm just saying it makes me wonder why did, why was this so important to them that they were willing to have it look so distracting to the player and then so the other well, let me just quickly cover it like it's important when you make such a decision even if you really like it something should go off in your head a little alarm that says I like it, but here are the ramifications. It does make the screen more distracting, and it does make it harder to read if there's an enemy in there, especially if it's green too, or Luigi is there. It makes it harder to see Luigi. And what's more important to me? You have to make that judgment call as the art director of the game. So you should always be willing, especially if you have the time, uh, to try the other options right so uh let's see i will use stencil mode again to oops go into stencil mode clear it go into select select that color and then uh, reverse my selection and now i'm going to select the darker green go into filled rectangle mode and now i can just quickly make it all the solid dark green and you could see instantaneously like you might go oh but that looks too simple well it doesn't look colorful enough but now you'll see oops i have to turn off the stencil now you'll see when i grab mario in his green boot now we have beautiful readability just as readable as against the sky 
when he's again when he's in front of these hills and then the other thing once we get to that point we could try also a repeating pattern but make it something that makes a lot more sense in general something like these sorts of wavy lines that did actually become a typical mario aesthetic in later games mm -hmm. so like this might be too thick and this you know this is just a really rough uh idea or suggestion but you could make a repeating tile pattern that has this sort of thing going on um and then fill your yeah and it would have kept the uh the sort of um curviness or smoothness of the hills right. themselves going on so you know you're you're sticking with that idea of even though you're using these contrasting colors back there you know the fact that they're not hard straight edges implies that oh they, right. you know, you, it's not in the way it's not gonna right yeah so yeah that's a really rough flood fill let me actually see if i could do a better job than that if i get rid of that first so you know that was really crappily done but you can see how that makes more sense for what the bushes are mm -hmm. and if i had done it more carefully with the curvy shapes it might end up well certainly less distracting than those sharp jagged shapes but yep. in my opinion like it's worth playing with those sorts of options like another thing could have been well maybe we'll just use the light green and just add some little highlights to the tops of the hills something sort of like this you know mm -hmm. what i mean and taper it down so there are a lot of different things to try that could have kept it you know and you could cheat or do stuff like that depending on how many tiles you had to spare but th there were other potential patterns or just using a solid color that would have kept the readability at 100 percent um and uh kept it at a softer aesthetic that maybe would have made more sense when all of the other bushes in your game look like bushes and then you've got that you know like crazy pattern uh it's worth considering but anyway so that that was uh the point i wanted to make with that particular screen okay and now to move on we've only got a few more screens that i think uh that represent other relative topics to bring up before we wrap this this video up and did you want to pick a partic uh, particular screen to... Uh... Um, I would say it's worth noting if you, if you like look at all of these screens, even the overworld map of all things, uh, they, they have the same HUD and it's got the same colors throughout everything. And uh, Alright, let me load up one of them. Is there one in particular? You'd, uh, we haven't done the fish yet, so why don't we do... Yeah, like yeah, we haven't definitely. looked at this screen yet. Okay. There we go, which is very nice. Oh, as you can see, no black outlines on the water. Right, yeah. And uh, But everything else does. And anyway, go ahead, uh, let's talk about this HUD. Yeah, so, and it's worth noting here that, you know, in some of the levels, they actually make use of this palette that they've reserved for the HUD to draw, like, the sky and the clouds and things like that. Right. Uh, but in this particular level, it's noted that, you know, they're not doing that. I mean, they're right. they're actually um, very limiting to what colors they're using on the level right. itself. So, in other words, we know there are four total three color palettes, basically three color plus the background color for mm -hmm. the tile. So, any tile on screen has to use any of those four palettes. So, you're already very limited. And as we mentioned, sometimes you need to double up on one color being used by multiple palettes if you need that color to be used in different tiles. Uh, so that's another limitation. And then if you want your HUD to stay cohesive throughout the game, to keep the same color scheme, now you need to reserve a one of the entire four color palettes at least for your HUD, which is what they did here. You can still use it in your environment graphics, and they do in some levels but that's another limitation to keep in mind their other option would have been to change like let's say you had a very different looking level and you wanted to be able to use all four background tile palettes you would need to come up with you would need to change the color palette of the hud palette in a way that it still worked for the hud 
but still introduce those new colors f to use in this new environment. But obviously that would mean the HUD would change. Suddenly the HUD might be a tan or brownish tint or a greenish tint. So you would be trading the overall visual quality of being able to add more color variety to your backgrounds in between each level, but there would be a massive price to pay, which would be your HUD would not be cohesive and would not look the same no matter what the level was. And that's a really big price to pay because in a video game, the critical stuff that is constantly giving you information, you don't want that to change how it looks. You want that comfort of familiarity to be there and consistent as much as possible. So the designers of this game obviously decided it was way more important to have the HUD consistent across the entire game than it was to have that potential extra fle flexibility of being able to change more colors in between each different environment so, and it's worth yeah, yeah and I, I was going to point out too that uh you know you see if you scroll up a little bit you see that cloud there uh that is drawn with the hud palette but it's still got the sky color remember right. the sky color is the zero color right the back the color. shared color for all of the palettes so right the hud specifically if you notice it's always just got the three colors right it's not using whatever background color that they're using for the sky because that's going to be switched right. out every level or different worlds you know right so so excellent point so they they can at least with the hud palette at least well yeah it's still they, they've lost all three special colors well they didn't lose it but it has to be those colors no matter what level you're making one of your four palettes is this palette right so which is great if you need things like ice or sky and clouds potentially or things like that um but anyway an excellent point point. and while this screen is on one of the last things that we should talk about and i mentioned it very briefly in general about other games that um use tricks to be uh to make the nes look more powerful is uh the idea of screen slicing do you yes. want to talk about the the water in this case puts use, or you, go ahead? You, you, yeah. You go. Well, not only is the HUD itself a screen slice, so that's you know that's always present, and uh, but in this level in particular, if anyone who's played the game will remember, the it looks like the water level is the same all the way across, and then the level itself moves up and down. Right. Uh, so like the level that Mario's standing on. And, uh, so I can simulate that. So at some point, uh, it might scroll so that the level is this low. Right. And then scroll so back up like that. It gives the illusion that the water level is sort of rising and lowering. But, right. uh, you know, you can only do these slices horizontally. You can't do them vertically on the right. NES. And uh, I don't know if there's a limit to how many you can do. Um I, I've seen games that do quite a few of them. Right. Uh, I'm sure there is, and I'm sure with the yeah. this sort of helper chips, I'm pretty sure like that more modern NES games had like Battletoads and uh, this game Super Mario Three. I'm sure they can get away with more because that chip just in general gave the Nintendo more processing power. Yeah. So I'm sure there's a limit, and in general for Super Mario Three, you're only going to see I if I recall. Pretty much, like you said, the HUD itself is a screen slice, and the reason we're saying that uh, is the, the Super Mario can scroll horizontally or vertically, uh, the level does, but the HUD never does. So it's on the screen, but even though the rest of the screen is scrolling, it stays put. So we yep. know that they're using that technique of quote-unquote screen slicing to allow that to happen, to allow this, the HUD to stay still and the rest of the screen to scroll around. And it's so, worth noting, too, that yeah. anytime you do see a HUD on one of these old games, particularly the NES, right. and it's floating and it looks like it's not contained within a box or anything, mm -hmm. that is drawn with sprites, um, right. usually. Um, and there are certain games that can get away with it, usually if you have a very minimalistic HUD and not much information. But obviously right. in Mario, they needed to display lots of information. Right. So That's a good uh, point. They, yeah. You know, One of the later games that I want to review with you, is, which I discussed with you, is Mega Man 2, which is another just brilliant uh, AAA game from uh, the, the golden era of 8-bit gaming. 
Um, right. But you mentioned HUDs made of sprites, and as any hardcore retro gamer might already know, the um, the HUD on Mega Man was vertical. Yep. And that was made out of sprites. And the reason it was vertical was because if you did it horizontally, remember, you have a max limit of eight sprites per horizontal line before you started getting some really nasty flickering. And you don't want critical information like how healthy you are, how close you are to death, to be disappearing and flickering while the player is trying to fight and see how close they are to death. Plus, it's just aesthetically very unappealing the more flickering you have. So yep. that was a reason to stack it because now you only have one sprite that you're waste, quote unquote wasting for the HUD per horizontal line. And while this is, be, while, since you brought it up, there was one screen that, if you remember, it had, it had the, the Koopa and another line was missing. Do you remember what screen that was? Like it's the only screen grab we have that shows the sprite flicker we're talking about. Yeah, um, uh, I think if you, I think it's that one right there where Mario's here. on the platform. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so the reason this is happening is because this moving platform is a sprite. So even yep. though it's rectangular, even though it's like sort of a background object psychologically, because they needed it moving, it's made out of a bunch of sprites, and this is a pretty big object horizontally. That's the critical thing when you're thinking about sprites. So it's 48 pixels wide. So, uh, yeah, that's most six, of your sprite. Six, six wide, yeah. There you go. So six sprites right there. And then this Koopa is also, are, are they Koopa? Uh, those aren't Goombas, right? Those are Koopas, I think. Yeah, I, I guess they were. Yeah, I don't remember. <laughs> but anyway, so. <laughs> I just always called them turtles. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's your other two. So we have eight. So right here right on this horizontal line which is called a, a scan line um you'll see that because you already have more than than is allowed this one is flickering away this one is flickering away and this one is flickering away and and note that the reason yep. it's that one sliver of pixel right is because mario's foot is overlapping the pattern one uh, pixel. by one pixel there right. into those sprites. So you have right. those six across, then Mario's foot, and then you have that guy right. over there. Right. So you're so. over by at least one, probably two sprites. Right. So that is why you have at least two, in this case, three sprites disappearing because they went over the uh, the eight sprite limit of per horizontal line. And that is the interesting thing to keep in mind. The entire sprite doesn't disappear, only that particular line. Uh, right. So a lot of times you might be designing your game and you might think the flickering will look worse than it does, but it's often not too bad if you're careful because in extreme cases like this, only one line will disappear um, of of the graphic. So it's it's less distracting and less unappealing as if the entire sprite was disappearing uh frequently so um anyway yeah that that covers the uh the sprite flickering thing but let's go back on topic to screen slicing and explain a little bit more about the uh the water um yeah um in this particular level if you see it animating i mean the water pretty much stays the the same, same height spot. on the screen. Uh, right. The only thing they did is I think they used animated tiles to animate like the top of the water. The waviness, right. Um, but yeah, any any part of a screen slice can be scrolling any way. It can be vertical, horizontal. Right. Um, you know, obviously you can't go nuts with it or it's going to look too too jarring. But, right. um, but this is one of those perfect examples of, you know, anytime you see, like, and they've done these tricks in, in the Mega Man games as well, where you'll right. see, like, a section of the world moving up and down, it seems. There's right. always, you can always point to a perfect horizontal section or line That's, where that, right. that is no longer the case, you know? Right. Uh, there's a clear separation. So this is just an example that visually shows it very clearly, uh, right. but it's not always so clear because... Uh, 
people can be more clever with how they right. hide it. So. And you will also notice that there is one entire row across the whole screen that is only the background color. And yep. that might be a necessary, I assume it is, a necessary side effect of the screen slicing trick. Yep. So, uh, and you'll see again, same exact thing, screen slice for the HUD. And in this case, because this level requires two screen slices, it's got the screen, or in a sense, you could consider it three. It's got three sections. It's got the playable area that Mario is on land above the water. It's got the water and it's got the HUD. And this has now slightly passed what the Nintendo, even with the helper chip, was capable of. So there's a slight glitch on every level where you see this screen slicing in Super Mario 3. You will see this first 8 pixel uh, row in the HUD that should be black will flicker uh, the background color or maybe some other colors. And that is a hardware glitch caused by this trickery taxing the hardware slightly more than it's capable of pulling off perfectly. But again, this was another trade-off. Is that tiny little gl graphical glitch, is that more, is that, does that make it not worth it to do all these cool tricks? And obviously yep. they decided, and I completely agree with them, it was way better to have these really cool, impressive, and fun levels that put use to these tricks. So that glitch was less, it was worth it. It was a worthwhile trade-off. But it does ultimately, to some tiny degree, it affects the overall impression of polish of the game because it's clearly a glitch. But there's a difference right. between a glitch and a bug, right? A bug yep. is an error in programming that potentially is avoidable and potentially could have been fixed. This is a glitch specifically because they were just taxing the hell out of the hardware. And it was unavoidable yep. given the other things they wanted to do. It was a trade-off. It was a, a, an undesirable result, but an acceptable result for achieving the things they wanted to do within the hardware limits. So just so, something uh, to be aware of. Yeah, and I think there are a couple more screens that are examples of the slicing, um, right. uh, just used in different ways. Yeah, this uh, is a good one. Why don't you explain? Yeah, the the little matchup game is an example. It's it's horizontal screen slices, right. uh, and the reason you can tell that they're not animated tiles is because when they come close together and slowly animate, they they move very smoothly. You know, pixel right. by pixel. Right. Um, and it's worth noting here that they have a border on the left and right sides right. that does not move, and I suspect that yeah. that was done with Sprite. Yeah, uh, I would think it would have to be. Like, yeah. if they used a massive amount of tiles to create this illusion of scrolling with animated tiles, I don't think they would have been able to fit that many tiles in memory. No. Because no. you have, for the top row, the bottom row, and the middle row, that is a lot of art. And to create the illusion of everything scrolling, you would need every tile times eight. Because a tile width is eight pixels, so you need to make it look like that tile can scroll smoothly one pixel over eight times to be able to create a looping scroll so that you could have... Uh, a full, the illusion of a full smooth scroll uh, of the entire screen. So yep. you take all this graphics you're seeing now, you multiply that by eight, there's not a chance in hell that would fit in the Nintendo's memory. Yeah, so, in fact, if you, <clears throat> include, if you include the HUD uh, and the tiles that have to be reserved for that, you know, I would say the mushroom and the star and the flower just by themselves uh, right. w would have barely fit. Uh, exactly in, right. Into the two fifty. What is it? The two fifty six by two fifty or no one twenty eight by one twenty eight. Yeah. So, uh, so pixel right. space. Yeah. I'm gonna call it that. Those side things have to be sprites, and it was brilliant because like let's analyze mm -hmm. this. So, basically, the only way you could have things scrolling independently like that and uh, without slicing the screen would be to use animated tiles, but they could never have art this big and scroll it with animated tiles. So that's out right. the window. The only other option is screen slicing, 
And the problem with screen slicing is screen slicing works completely across the entire horizontal screen. So you can't have a border on the side not end up getting sliced too in scroll. Yeah, it would be moving along <clears throat> with the other. If it was made of tiles, right. it would be moving along with everything else in that row. So, yeah. so their perfect crime, <clears throat> excuse me, their perfect crime was to use simply one uh, sprite wide across both sides uh, of sprites, just stacked, just like Mega Man's meter, to cover over the background graphics, over the screen slice, to make it look like the, it's not screen slicing, it's this, you know, this, uh, uh, what do you call it, like gambling game, a slot machine type thing going on. And uh, which just makes it so much more aesthetically pleasing. Um, yep. And the cool thing is you obviously don't need sprites for anything else in this particular game level or a game screen. And you have a, a maximum of 64 sprites, but you're not even going to come close to that. And keep in mind, you don't need to do it up here uh, because you don't need to be slicing the screen up here. So theoretically... Right? Yeah, that's true. They could have built the very top uh, and right. bottom with just tiles, yeah. So it could be that they only needed this much in height of tiles at, at mm -hmm. times, you know, and it's only two sprites per scan line, so there's not going to be any flicker. So it was the perfect crime, very simple, it used very little memory, and it was the perfect way to just add that polish to have the, uh, the, the rotating in a nice simple frame. So beautiful yeah. use. And you can see, because they had to slice the screen a lot, there is not here, which is interesting, there is not that one pixel row of solid. So maybe that is not a, a detrimental limitation. However, yeah. what is very interesting is there's a new glitch. You could see that on exactly that pixel row where they slice the screen, it's misaligned. Mm -hmm. And that is clearly unintentional, but it's it's happening in every case. So it might have been, they may have made the decision to either, like they probably could have, had it use the solid color to avoid that glitch, but then when the colors, when, when, the, when the faces came together, when you push the button, then there would have been an annoying slice they wouldn't be complete images. They'd have they'd be sliced apart, if that makes sense. They'd have two yep. slices in them. So they probably made the decision, while it's scrolling, to have this almost unnoticeable one pixel row problem where the scrolling is, is not synchronized. But that way, when they finally stop, the, that glitch will stop and everything will be properly aligned. So that was another decision, what's worse, what's better. We can either yep. deal with a hard-to-notice technical glitch, or we can replace that glitch with something that looks clean, but actually looks less appealing overall. Um, so, It's worth noting as yeah. well that they use this same exact border on the overworld. Oh, good point. And, uh, you know, there are sections of the overworld where, you, where you'll go over a screen and it'll scroll a little bit. And right. I, I believe what they're doing there is jumping the overworld by eight pixel increments uh, when it scrolls right. um, to like just basically just jumping the tiles and what they're doing is mm -hmm. on the le you know for that border they're just drawing on top of everything in those tile areas right the border instead of using sprites so. right that makes perfect sense especially because uh, do you want to mention what are sprites here in the overworld map I'll zoom out a yeah little. yeah um of course, Mario is. Um, mm -hmm. But the the numbers above the warp zones are sprites in this section. And you can tell by looking at the top numbers, which are over the coastline. And they would otherwise be tiles that were using uh, more than the allotted colors. Right. Um, so they just, you know, they knew that there was going to be nothing else in this scene except Mario. Sprite-wise, right. No other right, sprites. in right. terms of sprites. Um, so they... They just plopped these uh, simple numbers right. on top of it. And the so. nice thing is, like, uh, a very typical uh, font size mm -hmm. for classic 8-bit games was 8 pixel wide. So you could see exactly 8 pixels, right? 
So each letter or number only used exactly one sprite and you could place it wherever you needed to. And they knew in the case of this warp zone, they were never going to run into the problem of having eight sprites across. Right. So even with Mario, even if Mario were big, uh, you've got like, he's like two or three sprites and then you only need three more sprites. So you'll end up with a nice clean map with numbered worlds and no flicker. And I think pretty much the last thing, unless there's something I'm missing, uh, something I've forgotten, uh, we could just quickly mention the uh, pop-up text windows. Yeah, yeah, sure. And just, uh, you can see it uses the same frame as the HUD uh, mm -hmm. and the same tile palette. So again, in a game, you want that consistency of like any user interface thing that's going to be repeatedly there to give the player information you want that to stay cohesive and the same as much as possible like if you need to make a decision that's going to make the ui look different at any part in the game give that decision a lot of weight give that trade-off a lot of weight that's a big deal because you want the overall sort of user experience for the for the player to stay really consistent and and become very familiar and comfortable and if the palette changes or the design or the font changes depending on what screen you're on or you know even on the same screen i've seen some games where they go crazy like you pick a menu thing and it's one font and one color and then a new pop menu window pops up and it's a totally different font and new colors and stuff like that it can work and you can be creative but just be careful and keep in mind back in the 8-bit Nintendo days, they did not have that kind of memory and those right. that many palettes available to go crazy like that. So yeah, for the sake the of memory... Yeah, right. you got to think of all the letters in right. the alphabet. I mean, just a font would take up a good bit of space in your VRAM, you know. Exactly, which is so. also why almost all the time in classic games, especially that also required a lot of graphical uh, like images on screen, Usually, the, also for the sake of readability, it's all uppercase because having a lowercase letter for every letter would double the amount of wasted graphics uh, for yep. your font. So, and it would be less readable. And if you know the word kerning, anyone that's dealt with fonts in their life, um, kerning is how your letters are spaced apart. And keep in mind, if you do like most classic bitmap fonts or fonts made out of actual like graphical data um, in classic console games and in old computer games they kept each letter width consistent it was every letter took exactly eight pixels wide so if yeah. you're designing uh, lowercase letters that are shorter it might look wide that they're still the full eight pixel width so yeah and there it, and there are some games that you know games that are very text heavy uh, have went the route of, of adding the extra lowercase letters, like right. things like Dragon Quest do right. that. Exactly. Um, and another thing w when it comes to Dragon Quest, I know this is a little off topic, but it's worth noting that anytime you know, you're playing an NES game, and you remember, you can only draw on the NES the background tiles as one layer, and then right. the sprites as a second layer. So anytime you see a large text box right. pop up, that is drawn with tiles, and it has to be drawn right. in the exact spaces where those tiles meet, uh, according right. to the background graphics. So exactly right. that's you may be wondering why the classic RPG thing is, you know, the character animating in such a way that they move every tile, right? They move right. every sixteen pixels, and then they jump to that spot, and then they stop. The reason being is because when you're scrolling around a map in something like Dragon Quest and you need to pop up a, a dialogue box or something drawn mm -hmm. with tiles, it needs to be in the exact same pixel location on screen every time it pops up. That, that's a really so, great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so... Uh, you like, know, otherwise, literally, they would have know. had... Otherwise, literally, they would have had, had to make the game quickly scroll to an exact 16 by 16 grid right. every t first before they could make the window pop up, or drastically worse, the pop-up window would always pop up in a slightly different location on screen, which yeah. would be I mean, just really off-putting. 
And and there is the possibility they could have done a screen slice to handle that, like maybe right. one that kind of slides up or something right. like that, which would have been a little better. Uh, In some know, cases, yes. Had, yeah. Right. But at the same time, it could have caused the glitchiness. You know, they probably didn't want to go that route. So right. they very cleverly designed right. it in such a way that... And keep in mind, could, like the screen you know, slice option, that forces you to use the full width of the screen. Right. Exactly. The, right. So it's definitely everything's got a uh, everything's got a trade off, and these are the kinds of hopefully uh, people watching this video find it as intriguing and intriguing and fascinating and entertaining um, as we do. But uh, these are the kinds of this is the kind of information that it was critical for pixel artists in the day to understand and uh, to be a professional pixel artist, especially in a AAA title you had to not just understand these limits, you had to relish working within these limits and trying to figure out the ways to hide these limits or just make beautiful stuff happen within these limitations. And, uh, you know, Nintendo were, was one of the uh, studios that um, just always had that, that love and passion, and which was why they made some of the most iconic and beloved uh, games that survived right past the 8-bit and 16-bit era into the modern era. They, the the uh, dedication to, uh, to quality uh, and to, to artistry and um, establishing, like, like we said, like establishing a very specific aesthetic and coming up with these sort of rules that you only break if absolutely forced to. Uh, and again, that goes also to the familiarity. Uh, you should mm -hmm. always be really careful if you're, if you have this idea that you think is really cool, but it really goes against one or more of these what were concrete rules for the aesthetic of the entire franchise. You should weigh that very heavily. Like, is that really such a cool idea that it's it's more important that you know that it's worth breaking your own aesthetic rule? Because even it, even though like non artists and people that don't understand how these decisions are sort of made, they will feel the end result of those decisions. Yep. You know what I mean? Like if you're changing the color of your HUD per level, so you have those colors, they will feel the impact of that decision. They will, yep. they will feel that the game is a little lower quality or a little less comfortable to them than it otherwise would have been if you had made that different decision of making sure that HUD stays the same across every level. So, yeah, and plus, uh, it would, you know, it would also just affect the readability of the HUD per exactly, level. You know, exactly. you might you might have a slightly darker colors or different values there, right? And uh, people, the gameplay would might get altered a little bit. You know, right. uh, so you got to weigh those things when you're making these decisions. So. Right. So yeah, I think I think that wraps up all. Let's just quickly look through. The folder and make sure that uh, we've discussed every particular thing we wanted to. Uh, overworld map. Uh, we could briefly mention that in the overworld map, Mario faces forward. Yeah. And theoretically, I don't think he ever faces, aside from when he turns into the Tanuki statue, I think he never faces forward during gameplay levels. I could be wrong. My memory could be. Uh, not I, I don't think so. There might be a forward facing for when he turns left to right. I'm not quite sure uh, if you could find it in the right. uh, the sprite uh, sheet, but right. yeah, uh, that's that's probably the only frame that it would do it. Yeah. Right. So th like that was the only other interesting thing I, I thought was worth mentioning on the map screen. It helps the map screen seem more unique, and it sort of makes it a little more charming. Because now the character's like looking at you, almost interacting with you, almost asking you, where do you want me to go? Mm -hmm. So it just makes it a little more personal. And then the other thing to keep in mind is if you use the walking frames for when Mario is going left and right, suddenly there's pressure to make new walking frames for when he's walking up or down. Right? So if mm -hmm. he's always facing forward, you kind of just accept that, right? on the map screen. It's like, oh, it's an icon for Mario. He's always facing me. That makes sense. But if he's walking and actually playing the walking animations to go left and right, if he walks down and up and he's like moonwalking upward or downward, still facing sideways, 
that's going to feel cheap. Again, you're going to affect the overall sense of quality of your game. So they made the smart decision. It was better for memory and it was better for the overall um, comfort level and appeal of the game to have Mario face forward in the overhead map instead of just reusing the side view from the rest of the game levels. Yep. So, and I, I, all right, let's just quickly go through the other images and see if that is everything. Oh, um, there's no harm. I'm suddenly getting a lot of uh, noise on your end. Is your, do you have like a fan going or something? There, it quieted down. Uh, it's a train going by. Ah, okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to make sure it didn't keep going, uh, if possible, uh, for, you know, any length of time or we could stop recording and but anyway so um th there's no harm in discussing quickly stuff that's more related specifically to gameplay design uh, but this does also tie into the technical element so do you want to do you see the screen i have up yeah, yeah. do you want to talk about this a little bit yeah this is one of those little fun uh areas in the game where you know you can kick this shell uh yeah I'll down this little it. area and it ends up you know, uh, turning you know, hitting these these secret blocks that that right. become coins. Right. Th um, those are it, sort of what keep it corralled in. It's these and the pipe. So right. each of these down this diagonal perimeter here, these are all the kind of block that will become a solid metal block when hit by a shell or when Mario jumps up and hits it with his head. The rest of these are the ones that shatter and leave the shrapnel. Mm -hmm. And you'll also see this clever opening downward here and here. It creates this sort of stair step effect. So what happens is the shell, Mario kicks it, it goes this way, and it hits this, which becomes solid, hits here, and it's going to bounce back, and then it's going to go down on this hole, and it's going to keep bouncing back and forth and destroying all of these, and it's staying corralled in by these... Uh, these blocks that are going to turn metal and the pipe. So anyway. Yeah, and, and it's worth noting in this scene that how carefully designed this was because the blocks, uh, particularly the busting bricks and also the, the special blocks that get turned into coins, uh, a lot of sprites going on here. You have the brick pieces and then you have the you know the coins popping out of the box right. which are sprites right and uh you know i think they designed this in such a way where there would not be too many horizontal uh sprites going right. on at any given moment based right. on this little trick um, right which is pretty so amazing they, like everything yeah, is sort yeah. of carefully designed to be quite vertical so right. you already have the danger of the shell itself which is two sprites wide by the looks of it right mm -hmm. And then one thing that we didn't point out yet is that not only are the coins that pop out of the, the bricks uh, sprites, but if you remember, I'm pretty sure when you jump up as Mario and hit the tile from beneath, it doesn't just instantaneously turn into the metal tile. It bounces a little bit. It goes up a few pixels and then down into place. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that's the case. And for it to bounce like that, what they're doing is they're they're replacing the tile with a background tile, immediately showing a sprite that looks like the same brick, making the sprite move quickly up and then back down into place, and then once again finally destroying that sprite and putting back the new tile of the unbreakable metal, metal block in this case. So when the shell is bouncing, you have the two sprites of the shell, uh, potentially the two sprites wide of the block while it's bouncing and then you also have a coin coming out but the nice thing is the coin is separated vertically so that's not going to add to the flicker right, right? so all of these sprites that are coming out of it aside from the bouncing block which is only there for a split second everything else is sort of appearing above the other the shell sprite and the current block sprite right mm -hmm. and then so you have two sprites two sprites and then Mario is at least two sprites wide. So the only way you're going to get flickering is if Mario puts himself in danger and goes on the same level of, as his fat, quickly bouncing back and forth shell uh, while it hits a brick 
and the brick is bouncing, that would be the only case where you would actually end up with a flicker. Uh, sprite yeah, and flicker don't, effect. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, this game uh, is definitely not devoid of flicker. I mean, right. you're going to find it in little places here and there, but it's rare enough to where it does not ruin the experience. You know, right. like they, they, they minimized it as much as they could in right. this game. Um, right, it's being careful with your design. Okay, we need to make a brick shatter. But can we do that with as few sprites as possible and just as importantly, like let's say you want to use four sprites to make that brick shatter. What you can do is make sure in every frame of that animation of them shattering, only two of them are ever on the same level vertically, right? Or yep. uh, I should say horizontally, like always, there's only two across. And then you can have the mm -hmm. other two always above those two. So now it, that design that animation is drastically less likely half as likely to cause flicker yep anyway so uh yeah let's see if there's any other images uh that we want to talk about um absolutely beautiful game um, yeah uh recently in one of the retro facebook pages that i belong to retro gaming one of these little um clickbaity kind of questions popped up if you were stuck on a stranded island magically that had you know working electricity and like you could have any two consoles but only with two games like you can play two retro games what two games out of any console uh you know any developer what two games would you want to have with you and super mario 3 was my obvious first pick as the it, you know it was tough to pick the second game but the first game mm -hmm. was really easy to pick like it's a it's a timeless classic it's re replay value is through the roof oh yeah so anyway uh i think that is all the screens unless there's something specific in any of the sprite rips that we quickly found from the internet i can't think of so there's enemies i mean we already analyzed mario and talked about the optimizations i think that's the really important thing mm -hmm. so unless there's something specific um are there any like tile set things you wanted to discuss i think we just covered most of it pretty well um, yeah um I, I don't i don't think so i mean most of the, you yeah. know you, most of the enemy sprites in the game you know are very minimalistic um right. uh, in terms of their animation you know mario's the one that's really animated you know, right. and they, these these sprite these tile rips uh, don't don't necessarily do it justice in terms of showing off the limitations of the palettes because uh, right. they're all just kind of crammed in here, right? Uh, from different levels and things, uh, but they do give you a good example of like, oh, you know, the pipes there, for example, right. they're all the same tiles on the cartridge. They're just swapping out the. The Ch palette, changing the colors in different right. levels you know right. that gives you an example there right. uh, of how they can save space you know and they, right. they were doing that constantly in these old games uh, right. whether you realized it or not you know yep in fact little bit of trivia in mario one at least super mario brothers the same tiles were used to create the bushes and it was just they used uh they made the tile use a green palette and mm -hmm. that those same tiles made the clouds in Mario, Super Mario. So uh, yeah. that's another great example. And look, by the way, speaking of those very strange uh, decision with that Bush's tile, look, mm -hmm. somewhere else in the game they did use a plain solid color like I had demonstrated. Yep. So like it was a really specific conscious decision in those particular levels to have that very specific aesthetic despite it being distracted distract a distraction. So it definitely they definitely knew exactly what decision they were making and it was obviously obviously a deliberate decision. So Yeah. And it's also something else I don't think we mentioned about the tiles is they are indeed eight by eight tiles, but a lot of times the way people would construct things on the NES, not only yeah. due to the palette limitations of sixteen by sixteen pixels, right, but uh, they would actually create tile sets that were a subset of constructed eight by eight tiles. Right, exactly. So they, like this one they here. would still be able, yeah, they would still be able to save space and memory based on the clever use of the eight by eight tiles but great point 
but construct the levels out of 16 by 16 tiles right uh, to save time you know right so you had to piece together right. those tiny tiles right so every to, time it would take forever right and not only that you are in massive risk if you're designing your levels with eight by eight tiles it becomes incredibly hard to keep track of that rule that you actually even though the tiles technically are eight by eight within every 16 by 16 pixel grid all four of those tiles that fit in that grid have to use the same palette. Mm -hmm. So if you were designing a level map with eight by eight tiles, you'd be grabbing uh, tiles that you expect to be using one kind of palette, but it would be forced to use the same palette as the other three tiles in that particular 16 by 16 pixel grid area. So, uh, so like if you look at these, this looks like you have the different tiles, different memory. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, seven or eight tiles. But in actuality, the majority of them are made with this one eight by eight tile. And then you've right. got one tile that's different to make uh, this blue pattern on the side. And that's reused twice here in this one tile to create a new tile. And then this flipped version is the same thing. So you have what looks like eight 16 by 16 tiles and it's actually probably made out of something like four or five unique eight by eight tiles so massive memory saving same thing here right like you've got this one eight by eight tile that's used over and over again yep. and then you've just got a few different tiles to make these uh, sides like this is the same one eight by eight tile used to put that black edge on this and these same thing on this side and so forth. So yeah, and this is why, like, any time you saw an NES game where they would do something akin to a cutscene type image, where they right. have like a really large, what seems like a really large, like like say it was a like a Schwarzenegger game or something, and they had right. this big picture of Arnold, they always would cleverly have large sections of of that character you know filled up with one color Solid or color, black yeah. or something right. and the reason being is because all those little sections of right. where they could get away with it are, are just the yeah. same black tile repeated right so they're saving memory they, they're making something what what is essentially larger appears to be larger than the space right. in vram right. but it's actually cramming it in there if you divided it up what a top, what so. a great final bit of information and point to end the video with fantastic uh Fantastic work, Corey. Like, no problem. Keep that in mind. I know this is true with the Sega Master System, and this probably is true also for the 8-bit Nintendo, but generally, you literally did not have enough memory to display any, not even a single, full-screen work of art. Right. The only way you could cover a full screen, that's how limiting the memory of the Nintendo was. Keep that in mind, everyone, when you critique or analyze an 8-bit Nintendo game and you're deciding how skillful the artists were, you literally, like if you're designing a splash screen or a cutscene cinematic, the only way to get a quote-unquote full screen image is if you're actually reusing tiles a lot. And a good artist could hide the fact that they were using tiles at all. And that was another critical skill if you wanted to make great looking 8-bit uh, games, uh, especially on the 8-bit Nintendo. And keep in mind, to make matters even worse, you're making a full, uh, full screen image. You've only got those four, basically three color palettes for the background. And so one of the tricks they would use to make a splash screen, a title screen of a game more colorful, is they would use those 64 sprites that they could, since you don't typically need a moving object or whatever, right. they would just overlay them over the background graphics as sort of decals to add more color to the screen. Yep. Uh, so that's another critically important skill. You design your overall screen, and then you have to do as best as you can to make it look as good and colorful as possible with those four background palettes. Then you can say, okay, I have a total of eight sprites maximum per scan line, unless I want my splash screen to flicker, which would be really low quality. <laughs> um, so eight sprites per scan line that are eight pixels wide, 
in a maximum of 64 sprites on screen total. And that's if I don't need also like a menu with a little button that says press to start. Because that is going to also eat up either tiles or tiles and a sprite for the little thing that's glowing or flashing. You know, yep. like if you have a menu, that's using up more of your tiles and probably using up a sprite or two. So those are the kinds of challenges that you have to face. Um, and uh, yeah, I, we hope that although we didn't talk aesthetically that much about the art, we hope this uh, video was entertaining and informative and will help give you uh, an even greater appreci appreciation for these AAA games that uh, these studios like uh, Nintendo and Capcom and so on were, were putting out back in the day. So we, I think the next video we're going to do, the next pixel art review video we're going to do is going to be Mega Man 2. Uh, are you up for that, Corey? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a classic. I, I would love to dive into that. So stay tuned for that, everyone. Thanks very much for watching. And Corey, thanks very much for being an awesome... Uh, I, I couldn't ask for a better co-host for this type of video, for sure. Uh, so, uh, no uh, problem. Much appreciated. All right. Uh, again, thanks everyone for watching, and I will stop the video now. Please comment below to let us know what classic retro game you'd like to see us review next. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more and support our retro game projects, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon for notifications. Please also check the video description for links for more information about our ongoing retro game projects. And thanks again very much for watching.